John, welcome to 69 Faces of Rack. How are you doing today? Thank you. I'm good, tired, sweaty, but happy. All right. So tell me about the beginnings of Conan. Oh, okay. Um, well, we started in 2006. Maybe late 2005, I started to get more interested in like fuzz pedals and uh, down tuning and stuff like that. And started to move away from bands like Foo Fires and Nirvana and started to be more interested in like a helmet. And then I discovered um, Fu Manchu, Slomatics, uh, then Black Cobra after that. Started getting into this like more like simple but more brutal kind of metal that I found the easier to play. And I thought, well, I can really attach myself to this and I, I feel I can enjoy creating music sort of in this shape. And uh, yeah, we, we, the band was called a few different names while we were rehearsing throughout 2005, 2006. We were called like uh, Elf Beater and uh, Pazuzu and a few other stupid names. And then one day I just thought, oh, Conan's a cool name because it was like represented like this like simple character that was also quite brutal. Mm. And I uh, thought that'd be an interesting name for a band like ours, and it stuck. Excellent. Now, uh, Liverpool, where are you from, right? Yeah. Uh, is known for all kinds of music. Mm -hmm. The Beatles, of course, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what kind of a metal scene do you have, SF? You know, there are some great bands currently in Liverpool. There are some great bands who've been from, uh, in, you know, who started off in Liverpool a while ago. I'll name a few. You've got Colt's Blood, Carcass, Anathema. You know, many others, um, but I don't feel like we've really... Bendel Interlude are another great band as well, so I should mention them and Zangi from some of the other bands that... When, when I first started doing Cone, and they were the bands I watched, but... So there was a cool underground scene, but I always found the shows not that well attended, and we seem to have not really f become part of it. So I, I don't really feel part of that scene, sadly. Mm -hmm. um, we don't get asked to play there all that often, and I don't know why. We tour the world, and we don't play Liverpool's every so often, or very often. But, I mean, yeah, we went to see a showcase night the other week, and I don't know, it just had a weird vibe that I remember from when I was playing those kind of shows. And, yeah, I don't know, something, there's something about it that's not, I don't, that doesn't really fit with me. How did you create your sound? Well, um, I think the sound we've got now is a, a bit more sophisticated than the sound that we had at the beginning. And at the beginning, our, the, main, the main strategy was to just literally play the most simple type of metal that, that I can. But make it sound really good, so I have like really nice amplifiers and not, not expensive but old and interesting ones. And try and find like fuzz pedals which just sound really good. And I just went on this quest for sort of tone or whatever. And uh, it was just meant to be just like focusing just bait on simple stuff. And then, of course, as time goes on, you notice people react differently to certain types of songs that we write and perform. And I think that has kind of influenced our, our writing process a little bit. Because um, we really enjoy playing live, so we kind of write our songs around the live experience, like are people going to love this. And, like I'd say 70% of our album writing at the moment is focused on like what's going to feel what's going to be fun to play live and i think that's changed our sort of writing style because we're not as fixated now on slow drawn out stuff we want to write songs but make them super heavy your vocal delivery tell me about that it's almost like you're not singing but you just open your mouth and it just emerges it's like i remember james heffield saying that he just tried to shout in tune and that's really all I'm doing. I'm just, you know, I like I like to sing in a sort of slightly higher register than what we're playing, and uh, that that's cool, I guess, because it adds an extra layer, makes it more like that wall of sound that people seem to like. Um, yeah, I've always kind of sung that. I mean, I don't think I've got like such a high-pitched talking voice, but I have got the ability to sort of squeeze it a bit and sing at a higher register. So, I guess I always have had that ability since I was a kid. Yeah. So by. 2012, you released your Monas, your first album. What can you tell me about that record? Um, well, Mon well, I actually consider Monas to be our second album, but most people say first. Yeah. <laughs> that the it came after Horseback Battle Hammer, which for me felt like an album, but I don't think it's been accepted as such. So Monas, yes, first album. Um, 
that was written sort of in between middle of 2011 and early 2012 and we had uh, Phil Coombe he just joined us on bass then um, and there was me and Paul on guitar and uh, I remember the first recording session we had for that was called off because of the snow and the studio was um, fully booked uh, we, was, was uh, blocked in with the snow in Wales <laughs> so we had to wait a while but that, that, that record came out on Burn and World Records in Holland and that made was you know we got to play Road Burn off the back of that I think and that ro- I think that album really opened sort of got us attention from people yeah. and really helped to get us a bit of a, a name I guess from then on so how did things progress with uh, Blood Eagle two years later? Um, again just a natural development from from um, from Monos, I think. Uh, I think Blood Eagles got just sort of marked a bit of a shift for us because we started to use like slightly more intricate riffs, like on Horns for Teeth, for example. That's kind of a, for us a complex kind of riff. Uh, and you've got, of course, you've got Faux Hammer in there, which is quite fast in parts. And um, yeah, Blood Eagle just marked a natural progression. And again, once again, felt like it just we gained more fans from that. Like mo- more, most people liked that album. It didn't get a lot of people saying they didn't like it. So that helped, that built our brand a little bit more. Uh, Revengeance gets released in what, 2016? And where is Conan now? At this um, point. What, where were we when we released Revengeance? Yep. Uh, well, actually, we changed and we switched drummers. And I think that album was kind of like our most sort of. I know that was a bit of a change in lots of ways because. We had like the song Revengeance on there, which was actually really, really fast. It was more like a hardcore song. It was a bit like Sick of It All, that tune. Um, and uh, some cool riffs on uh, on the song uh, Thunderhoof, of course, which is one of the songs that people like to hear us play. So yeah, I think that, uh, again, it's hard for me to sort of say there's any massive shift or massive gain from any of them. But I think we just like improved slowly over time and built up our sort of repertoire with each album yeah. which has helped us in our live setting because we've been able to like really nail in a good live show drawing from the you know the, the, the increasing number of songs that we've recorded so in 2018 existential void garden comes out and at this point what are you able to do in your career um, well we actually we've just been on tour with monolord mm-hmm. and um Johnny, who's now with us, I ju- literally just joined the last uh, in a few months earlier than that. And he came on tour with us at Monolord, and we had a few ideas, and we just said, you know what, let's just, as soon as this tour's over, let's just go in the studio and just record an album. Like, fuck it, let's see, let's just see what happens. And that's exactly what we did. We went in the studio, and uh, the album came together super fast. And again, that that again is another slight shift because. You got like Pain Cantation on there, which is like a, grind, a grindcore song, and a few other songs that I think took people by surprise. I think the vocals on, on Amidst the Infinite is like a super cool song, but we don't play that live because I don't think people really got the vocals on that. I think we maybe branched out a bit too much vocally. Um, yeah, that album's cool. Uh, there's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of songs on that that I still listen to now. Notice that each album comes out like every two years. There is consistency. Yeah. Are you comfortable with that format? Well, I was until COVID, and it was always our aim to do two years every two years. Uh-huh. And uh, in COVID, we, we obviously we would have had an album out in 2020, but what in fact what did happen was we um, we took a break and we released a live album live at Freak Valley, and then of course two years later, t- 2022. We were almost there, going to record, and then we just weren't quite able to get all together in the studio, but because of you know the ongoing COVID restrictions, and uh, so yeah, um, I beg your pardon. 2021, we tried to get in the studio, but then we were able to get the album recorded, sort of beginning of 2022, when restrictions lifted, um, and yeah, we released that in August last year. Um. So Evidence of Immortality, it's the newest yeah. one. Yeah. Um, what can you tell me about that record? Well, yeah, that was the one I was just talking about then. That was like, um, that was mostly written during lockdown. I like, probably had a lot of time to get things right. Yeah, exactly, and a lot of time to overthink things. And we, um, we, we, uh, 
I think it took us about nine months from sort of getting the first riff to sort of thinking we had a few songs ready. And we ended up we ended up releasing the album um, later than we expected. But like I'm really blown away by the response to the album. It's been really, it's been really good. Um, I love the album title. What does it refer to? Um, well, actually, during lockdown, my wife and I used to look watch a lot of shitty TV with like conspiracy theories and stuff. Neither of us believe in all that. We think it's funny. So we'd watch all these shows of people who were. Uh, actually believed that they could travel back in time mentally and they believe that they've like in the past spoken to like uh, prehistoric um, civilizations and stuff and I thought it'd be really weird if some of these guys actually thought that they were immortal and then they got me thinking I wonder what the wonder what proof they try and give and then I just thought that, that was a cool name for an album evidence of immortality which brings me to my next question, kind of a funny one. Do you possess any evidence of that? Uh, I don't, no. No, but I guess in our own way, we're all kind of immortal. You live on in lots of ways. So part, part, of, our, part of you will live on beyond you dying. But I don't really think it's too much. It's, too, it's beyond me. Um, yeah. Generally speaking, what are these songs about? Um, honestly, I mean, I have like a general theme of like battle between good and evil, sword and sorcery uh, and then a lot of the time it's just making it rhyme and fit but on the new album for example a lot of the songs are on there generally about warfare um, and obviously written during the time when you know what's happening in Ukraine so that it's quite natural that a lot of the lyrics sort of like reflect my feelings about that situation so yeah this album's a lot of it's about warfare and how unfair it is and how sort of it can make people angry and how people may feel feelings of vengeance and you know anger at what's happening so after five full-length albums are you in the place that you always wanted to be in well i'm in chicago so yeah i guess in a way <laughs> but like yeah, I'd, I'd say I'd say we are we are happy certainly within our career. We've we spent a lot of time on Napalm Records, and they've been like super supportive label. And through our own um, activities, we've you know toured the world more than once. So yeah, I'd say we're in a good place. We're ready to write some more music soon. See what happens with that. And we're going to enjoy this tour first. At this point, what's still a challenge? What's still a challenge? Yeah. Um, right now, physically, is is getting past jet lag because <laughs> the last few weekends the, uh, the sleep has been awful. Um, and another another challenge for me is trying to move away from needing a day job. I have a day job again now. I managed without one from 2013 until 2021. And then I had to take a day job, so I'm gonna at some point in the future hopefully get back to music full time. Um, what interests do you have apart from music? Um, well, I have a family. Um, I got three daughters and a son. So I like to hang out with them as much as possible. I talk to them every day. Try and be a good influence on their lives. Um, I like to walk my dogs with my wife, and uh, I like resting because I'm, I'm, I'm outside of work, outside of the band. I do have a lot on, so I'm also developing a software platform, which is like a like a networking, networking and artist management platform called Scene Gen. So that's taken up a lot of my time and energy at the moment, which is great because I'm really excited about that. So that's me in a nutshell, really. But outside of Cone, and I just do regular, normal, grown-up stuff. Finally, what's next for you? Um, well, we got Detroit tomorrow. Thinking beyond that, we got you know more festivals this year, and we'll start writing an album soon enough. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.